praise the Lord. You may be seated. God is good. Hallelujah. All right, let's see if this thing's working. All right. Welcome to Abiding Life, Grace and Faith Church. And those, those that are here in the room and those who are watching online. And uh, I hope you're enjoying the presence of God and the, the praise and the worship that was here. And we'll have another, another opportunity to worship the Lord near the end of the service. But uh, let's get right into the Word of God. Um, this is one of those, we're going to finish up chapter 4 of Galatians. We've been going through Galatians. And we're more than halfway, maybe about two-thirds of the way through the, the book. And we're going to, uh, we did the first half of chapter 4 two weeks ago. We're going to do the second half of chapter 4 today. And, you know, when, when people think about the, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Covenant representing law and rules and the New Covenant representing grace and faith, which is older? <laughs> just, for, just the fact that we call the Old Covenant the Old Covenant, it seems like it's older, but actually grace and faith were long before the law. The law didn't come around until Moses, but Abraham lived by grace through faith, and God always dealt with man by grace through faith before the law, and so this, this is not something new that God came up with, <laughs> you know, this thinking, well, this old way isn't working, let's try something new. No, it, you know, we weren't, the church isn't an afterthought in the mind of God. This is what God had been planning on all along. And the law, even from the beginning of the law, it was said to be temporary. God, I think God made it clear that this was not his best. This was a temporary thing. And um, I'm going to talk about, we're calling it our heavenly Jerusalem. I was debating on different titles and this is, this is the one we ultimately decided on. But um, let me briefly review chapter one. We went through chapter one. Chapter one is where Paul starts scolding the Galatians saying that they have embraced another gospel. What you're believing is not the gospel I preached to you. What you're believing is another gospel. And he, uh, he, wanted to encourage them to break, to embrace the gospel, the true gospel, the gospel of grace. And, uh, the second half of chapter one, I called it radical relationships where he talks about different, um, relationships that he had. And we talked about that. And then chapter two, I emphasize that it's only Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not Jesus plus something you have to do. It's all Jesus and only Jesus. And the second half of chapter two was about my identity, the fact that I, who, who he made me to be when I place my faith in him and I, my identity needs to be in him. Then chapter three, we talked about the just shall live by faith. And we also talked about in chapter three, the seed of Abraham. Chapter three to me is a very exciting chapter just to know that when, when God spoke all those promises to Abraham and his seed, he wasn't talking about every physical descendant <laughs> of Abraham, but the word seed is singular. And in Galatians 3, it makes it very clear that Jesus is that seed. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And if you're in Christ, you are the seed of Abraham. Hallelujah. How many of you are the seed of Abraham? Amen. Every hand should be up. I am the seed of Abraham. You're the seed of Abraham. Hallelujah. And that means you get to inherit all those blessings and all those promises now, last time, this was two weeks ago because we had a guest speaker last week, but two weeks ago, I made the statement that we don't have to obey rules, and that caused some confusion, apparently. So let me briefly explain what the, the thought that I was trying to convey, and I thought I explained it, but maybe not well enough. But when, when we're children, when we're small children especially, we have to obey rules, right? I mean, I can give rules to my children when they're, real small or my grandchildren now saying, you know, don't touch the stove or don't go in, don't play in the street or, or different rules um, that, you know, if I say that to my adult children, they will probably feel insulted, you know? Um, and so, so adult children, you don't really need to have to lay down rules. 
you know, don't enter my house unless you do this, 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 and don't do this, that, and the other, you know, so it's, it's different for adult relationships. And in, in the beginning of, of chapter four, Paul equates being under the law as being immature. If you're under the law where you need rules, you need to have a rule saying thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not steal Thou, I mean, we know that, right? <laughs> we have the spirit of God in our heart. So you don't need the list of do's and don'ts. What you need is the Holy Spirit in your heart. And he said he would place his, his law in your heart. And he does that by his spirit. So, uh, in, in chapter four, the beginning of chapter four, Paul equates being under the law as being immature spiritually. I mean, as, as a, a person who has the love of Christ in their heart, do you need the commandment thou shalt not commit adultery in order to not commit adultery? I mean, I hope you don't commit adultery because of your love for your spouse, right? Doesn't your love motivate you to be faithful to your spouse? And the same way with the commandments thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not kill or just the general principle of treating people honorably. You don't need rules for all that, do you? All you need is love. You know, Jesus said that love fulfills all of this, all of this. You're not going to steal from somebody if you love them. You're certainly not going to kill somebody if you love them. And you're, you're going to treat people honorably. So if you have the love of Christ in your heart, you don't need the rules. If you have the love of Christ, his love for you, which reflects outwardly to other people, you don't need the rules. All you need is the love of God. Uh, and that to say that isn't giving people permission to go break all the rules <laughs> and break all the laws. I mean, you guys understand that. I'm sure we ha we're all grace people here now. <laughs> so, so you understand that if God's love is in your heart, if God has placed his spirit in your heart and his love in your heart, you're not going to go breaking the law. Okay. God's law or man's law. But, um, you know, so we, we don't, so we do need, we don't need laws in order to do the right thing. All we really need is the spirit of God in our heart and his love in our heart. And cause truthfully, you know, the law can keep you, the law can restrict you. The law can keep you from doing certain things, but it doesn't motivate your heart. It doesn't motivate you to do the right thing. It'll keep you from doing the wrong thing, but it doesn't really motivate you to do the right thing. What you need to do, what you need to have is God's love in your heart to do the right thing. Well, that, that was the earlier part of chapter four. Now we're in the second half of chapter four. And in chapter four, the second half of chapter four, we see an allegory. We see a couple of allegories. We see the, the Sarah Hagar allegory, and we see the, the Mount Zion, Mount Sinai allegory. And we see Jerusalem as an allegory, the old Jerusalem and the heavenly, the earthly Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem. So, this is what we're going to take a look at right now. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that are here, and I thank you for those who are online. And I just ask you, Lord, to give me the words to speak. Bring things to my remembrance that you have been laying on my heart. And I just ask you, Lord, to open every heart and open, open every ear that they may hear what the Spirit is saying to the church this morning. And I just yield to you the best I know how that you may speak through me and convey your truth to your people. We give you the praise and the thanksgiving. Lord, we also invite you to confirm your word with signs following, as you promised that you would, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's get right into verses 17 and 18. They zealously affect you. Now, he's talking about those Judaizers, which we've talked about before. The Judaizers came into to Galatia, the different towns and different churches in Galatia, Keep in mind, he's not talking to one church. He's talking to several churches because Galatia wasn't a city. It was a province, and there were several churches uh, that Paul had established in that province. And so at the beginning of chap the beginning of Galatians doesn't say the church at Galatia, but the churches of Galatia. So we don't know how many, but there were several. And so when he says they zealously affect you, he's talking about the Judaizers, those, those Christians that believed that you still have to be circumcised, that you still have to keep every bit of the law, and that all a Christian is to them is a Jew 
that realizes Jesus is their Messiah, but, but they believe that they still needed to be faithful to all the Jewish customs and laws. And so he says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. So the Judaizers were flattering the Galatians so that the Galatians would flatter the Judaizers. That's basically the impression I get from verse 17. And he says, zeal is a good thing. And I hope you never lose your zeal. But I pray that you, you have your zeal. You use your zeal for good things. And I... I know the wording in King James is kind of awkward, so thank God for Amplified. The classic Amplified. This amplifies it to the point where I think it's, it's easier to understand what he's saying here. So these men, the Judaizing teachers, are zealously trying to dazzle you, pray court to you, making much of you. But their purpose is not honorable or worthy for any good. What they want to do is to isolate you from us who oppose them so that they may win you over to their side and get you to court their favor. One indication of a false leader or a false prophet, a, a false teacher, is that they make it all about themselves. You know what I mean? It, don't ever follow a leader who seems to promote themselves more than they do Jesus, and there's plenty of them out there. <laughs> um, I, I had a... a a meeting with a with a person about a week and a half ago here and and she was saying the problem with you grace people is you make it all about yourself and not about Jesus and I was thinking well what grace people are you listening to because it's the law people the le the legalistic people that make it all about themselves isn't it I mean what I have to do to please God I you know they put laws they have to obey every rule every law and and they're very legalistic about what they have to do to please God they're always trying to win God's favor and everything you do, <laughs> it's all about performance. And no, no matter what you do, how much you do, it's just not good enough. So it's the legalistic people that make it all about them. The grace people that I know make it all about Jesus because Jesus did it all for you. He, he finished the work. And he gives you the gift of righteousness. And, and yes, he, he blesses us in so many ways. And we realize that we are already blessed because of what Jesus did. But it's all about Jesus. So when she told me that, I really... She kind of lost me there because it, it just didn't make sense. Um, she also told me that grace people are always liberal politically. Again, I, I don't know what grace people she's been listening to, but, but that, that's not true with the <laughs> grace people that I know. Anyway, um, but I, I don't know. I guess people only hear what they want to hear sometimes. But um, so... Referring to the, the Judaizing teachers, the Judaizers, their intention was to isolate the Galatians from the gospel and from those who taught the gospel, like Paul and some others, Barnabas also, so that instead of the Galatians going to Jesus, they would go to them, the, the Judaizers. And so this is the amplified version of verse 17, and here's the amplified version of Verse 18, it is always fine, a fine thing, of course, to be zealously sought after, as you are, provided that it is for a good purpose and done by reason of purity of heart and life and not just when I am present with you. So, so I guess what he's asking is, what is the purpose of your zeal? And I guess I can ask that to you also. What is the purpose of your zeal? Does it lead you to purity or impurity? If you have a zeal for God, a zeal for the love, uh, for the things of God, and a zeal for his presence, you're going to be led towards pure things, not impure things. So the, the Judaizers were zealous, but not in a good way and not for a good purpose. In verse 19, he says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you tell me ye that desire to be under law do you not hear the law there, there's a lot in these three verses first of all in verse 19 it, it kind of implies 
intercessory prayer. At least that's what I hear in this. He's talking about travailing to give birth to them again. So he, he's in deep intercessory prayer for these congregations because it's, it's as if they've turned away from Christ. They've added to the gospel, you know, all these laws and circumcision and other things. And so, you know, they, they I'm sure, would say, well, we haven't rejected Christ. We just know that you have to do these things also. Well, then if, if, you, if doing all the law would get you salvation, <laughs> if keeping all you know, the circumcision and the feasts and the festivals and all the rules, if that would get you salvation, then what, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Jesus fulfilled all the, those things so that you don't have to do all those things. Praise God. So he's saying, it's like I'm having to give birth to you again. He's the one that birthed them. He's the one that brought them the, sal the gospel of salvation the first time. And he, sa it's, it's, he's, he, he seems to be saying in verse 9, I have to start all over again and give birth to you again. Because you just, it, apparently it just didn't take the first time. And verse 20 re-emphasizes again, I believe that Paul is concerned whether or not they're even saved. I desire to be present with you. Uh, and, and to change my voice, it's like he's saying, I know I'm presenting this in a harsh tone right now, but I'd like to be with you in present so I can show you that my love for you and compassion and, and present this to you in person. And he says, for I stand in doubt of you. It's like he's saying, I don't even know if you're true Christians or not by the, by the things that you're saying and believing. So I stand in doubt of you. That's, I, I just find that interesting. And then in verse 21, it's like he's saying, do you really even know what the law is? Tell me, you the desire to be under the law. Do you really hear the law or do you not hear the law? It's like, do you really know what you're getting yourself into? Do you know what you're listening to? Perhaps he's asking you the desire to be under the law. Don't you know that you have to hear the whole law? Because we've, we've talked about this in the past. Other scriptures ex explain that if you break one point of the law, you're guilty of all the law. So, so if you want to go down that road, <laughs> get out that list of 613 Old, old Covenant commandments and, and see if you can do that. So thank God for grace. Hallelujah. So here he gets into some allegories. The first one has to do with Abraham and his two sons and, and the mother of mothers of those two sons. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he that, was born, he that was of the free woman of the promise. Now, we all know, I, I think, the story of Abraham and Hagar, right? Um, for the sake of anyone that might be watching that may not know it, let me just very briefly, in a, just a minute or two, explain. Abraham was uh, very, very elderly, way past the, the years of, of parenting, and his wife was barren. Sarah was barren, and they were both elderly. And so God had promised that they would be the father. They, well, he, Abraham would be the father of many nations. So God promised Abraham children. And now that he's getting elderly, and, he, and his wife is elderly. His wife was 10 years younger, but she was barren. And Sarah had this bright idea. And this was not that uncommon back then, that you know they had a, a servant uh, it's called here the bond servant, bond woman, bond maid, um, that, you know, that, that they had. And Sarah had this bright idea saying, well, obviously I can't have children, but Hagar, she's younger than me probably. <laughs> and why don't you have a child with, with her and I'll raise it as my own and God can fulfill his promise through, through him. And Abraham probably didn't think long about that and said, okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there's no indication that he had any, any objection to the plan. So that he had a child through Hagar, and that's Ishmael. And so Ishmael was, they thought for a while, I'm sure, that this was the promised child. Um, but God entered the scene and told Abraham, that that is not the promised 
child, Sarah is going to have a child. And at this point, she was approaching 90. Um, he was pro approaching 100, and, he, and uh, she was approaching 90. And she laughs. She hears, she's, over, she's inside the tent, apparently, but she overhears the conversation outside. This is where Abraham has three. It's, first, they're just called three visitors, but if you read the whole thing, one of them is God or, or Jesus pre-incarnate, I believe. But so, but he says, Sarah is going to have a child and Sarah laughs. And then he says, why is Sarah laughing? <laughs> and she says, I'm not laughing, but he says, indeed you did laugh, but it, it was to come to pass. And he said, I think he said within a year or a year from now, it will be so. Um, but anyway, God, so God gave the child, she, she, he gave a child to Abraham and Sarah and they called his name Isaac, and there was friction between Isaac and Ishmael, and there was friction between Sarah and Hagar after that point between uh, because of the two children. So impatience leads to doubt. When God, when God gives you a promise, don't be impatient. Just believe it so. You know, if we if if we know God has given us a promise, and sometimes we know that God has promised us something, but after a few days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months, or even a few years, it just doesn't look like it's happening. But we know what God promised us. But if we're impatient, it leads to doubt. We begin to wonder. Well, did God really say that? Just like when when Satan approached Eve, remember in the garden, did God really say? So. Temp impatience leads to doubt and doubt leads to twisting the clear meaning of God's word. So what I mean by that is God gave a clear word to Abraham and Sarah about having a child, but because of their impatience, it led them to doubt and they began to twist God's clear message to them. And that's what led to the situation with Hagar. So, Ishmael was a product of self-effort. The bottom line is in this, Ishmael was a product of self-effort. Not, not just any, um, you know, not, not fully trusting God to do what he said he would do, but it's self-effort. In contrast, Isaac was supernaturally, supernatural, literally a miracle. And likewise, our walk by grace through faith is to be supernatural, a miracle, not self-effort. In, in the same way, Hagar and her son was a product of the flesh, and they were cast out. It, later on in the story, they get cast out of Abraham's group, family group, whatever it is, and they were sent away from the camp, and... So, so I find that interesting in the same way that Hagar and her son, who was a product of the flesh, were cast out. So those who seek to be justified by the law are rejected by God. At least that's the implication that we get from Galatians. But those who believe the gospel and receive salvation as a gift are like Isaac. We are compared to Isaac, the seed of Abraham, who came supernaturally by grace through faith, through the promise of God. So the legalistic Jews had been blinded to these truths. They had misinterpreted the purpose of the Old Testament law and were wrongly teaching that conformity to the law was necessary for salvation. So he goes on to talk about Sarah. Well, he talks about Mount Sinai. Um, he says, which things are an allegory for these are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. And this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So Hagar represents Mount Sinai, where Moses received the law, and the city of Jerusalem in Paul's time, which was enslaved at the time, they were enslaved 
to Rome as well as to to the law. So Hagar's children being enslaved, being slaves corresponds with the Jews' bondage to the law, or as the Living Bible states, the center of that system of trying to please God by trying to obey commandments. Now the word gendereth in that third line there, most translations translate that as bearing children. The Amplified Classic says that um, Mount Sinai gendereth, or let me find it again. I lost my place. Um, the, the Mount Sinai bears children destined for slavery. So under under the old covenant system, under that Mount Sinai system, under that Hagar system, you are destined to bondage or slavery, slavery or bondage to the law, relying on your own works for justification before God, like Abraham turning to Hagar to fulfill the promises of God. The earthly city of Jerusalem at, time, at that time was corrupt. Its inhabitants, its inhabitants rejected Jesus. And, um, and they rejected him to the point where they crucified him. And as a whole, they continued to reject the gospel of Jesus. And, but what is verse 26 talking about here? But the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. You know, that phrase con kind of caught my attention a little bit. Uh, what in the world is that talking about? The heavenly city of God of which the earthly Jerusalem is simply a symbol of or a type of. The, the heavenly city above, heavenly Jerusalem, is pure and it's free. So those who receive salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, faith in what Jesus did for them and not faith in what they do for God, but true salvation is faith in what he did for us, not in what we do for him through law or, or things of that nature. We are citizens of that Jerusalem, which is above. We are already, you're already a citizen of this new Jerusalem, this heavenly city that he's talking about here. So um, let me show you a couple of other scriptures that, that talk about this. Uh, this is in Hebrews chapter 11. But now they, they desire a better country that is heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So these people desire a better country. Now this is talking about the faithful people of the old covenant, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and, and them. They desire a better country that's heavenly. Where is this heavenly country? And what's the city that it speaks of? In the next chapter he says, but, but you are come to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and unto an innumerable company of angels. The, the previous verses clearly state that we're not called to Mount Sinai. We're not called to Mount Sinai. Again, that symbolizes law and old covenant and rules and, and a system of works, a system of self-effort and performance of the flesh. But we, but we've, we could not, they could not endure that, and we certainly could not either. So Mount Sinai is a representation of judgment, of terror, of con condemnation, of legalistic relationship with a holy God. It's a picture of trying to approach God through the obedience of the law. So if you're attempting to build a relationship with God based on an obedience mentality or um, obedience to law, obedience to commandments, you'll never make it. And nobody ever has. Uh, so, and he doesn't mean just do as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always reminded with to the Sermon on the Mount and that last part of chapter five where he says, be perfect. Have you ever looked at that? Matthew 5, 48, where Jesus says, be perfect. He lists a whole bunch of things. And then he says, well, let me just sum it up to you. Be perfect. <laughs> and he doesn't just stop there. He says, because some people will say, well, he just means do the best you can. I've heard people say this because I've taught this for many years, especially at school, the school that I teach at, what does Jesus mean by be perfect? 
And some people say, well, he just means do the best you can. Well, he didn't say be, do the best you can. He said be perfect. And then he says, even as your father is perfect. So nothing less than the perfection of the father is acceptable to get you into heaven. Nothing less than absolute 100% perfection equal to the father's perfection will get you to heaven. So how can you say, well, just do the best you can or God understands or, you know, all, he means to try to do good. He doesn't say that. He says, be perfect. So, so obviously no one can do it on their own, through their own efforts. So, and that's really the point. Jesus was, pre he was making it obvious that if they were determined to live by the law, this is God's standard. <laughs> be as perfect as he is. If that's your, if that's your desire to make it, it a legalistic relationship, a, a works-based relationship, nothing less than perfection will, will get you in. So then, he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. He lived that perfect life that you don't have to live. He lived, he lived that perfect life that you cannot live. He lived that life for you, and then he took your place on the cross. He became your sacrifice. And so all of our sins, all of our shortcomings, all of our failures, all of our uh, mistakes, they're all nailed to Jesus on the cross, and he gives us that free gift of righteousness. I don't know how people don't get this. You know, people always want to make it about, well, if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you'll get in. Well, Jesus said be perfect. So how does, how does your good deeds weighing out your bad deeds get you in? You know, so it's a, it's a mentality of people just not grasping what grace is all about. Thank God for grace. We'd all be doomed if it wasn't for grace. Hallelujah. Um, so anyway, let's go back to Galatians chapter 4. Verse 27, uh, <laughs> you know, we are just as much the children of the promise as Isaac was. And let me, let me go through these three verses. For it is written, rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travaileth not. For the desolate hath many more children than... Um, than she which has an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as, the, as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born of the Spirit, even so it is now. Now, let me explain. Verse 27 is a quote from Isaiah. It's a quote from Isaiah 54, and it's, a re, it's referring to Sarah, the barren, and she was told to break forth into singing and rejoice before she became pregnant. This was even, even when she was still barren, even before she had any children, God told her to rejoice. The barren Sarah rejoiced at the promise of God through faith. It tells us in Isaiah 11, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, it tells us that she rejoiced in the promise of God through faith. And through the promised seed, which is who? Who's the seed? Galatians 3, the previous chapter of, tells us Jesus is the seed. And if you're in Christ, you are the seed. So um, she rejoiced. She, she uh, let's see, let me back up. The barren woman rejoiced at the promises of God through faith, according to Hebrews 11, and through the promised seed, she had infinitely more children than, than the bondwoman did. And verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That might have been a better title for the, for, the, for the sermon. I don't know. We, as Isaac was, we are the children of promise. Just as much as Isaac was, he, he's the seed of Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham just as much as Isaac was. I think that's exciting because, you know, <laughs> nothing against the Jews. I'm, I'm what's the word? Anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-Semitic. I love the Jews. But I am more a seed of Abraham than they are if they don't have Christ. So I'm glad to hear you agree with that. Praise God. <laughs> so I am the seed of Abraham, not them. They may be physically, but I'm the true seed of Abraham, and so are you. Hallelujah. So... The promises are fulfilled in us. This is why, you know, when people start talking about, <laughs> to slightly change the subject, 
people start talking about, and you hear this all the time if you watch a lot of the um, people that talk about prophetic scriptures a lot, and they start saying that the temple has to be rebuilt before Jesus can return. Have you ever heard that? I'm sure we, we've all heard that. Jesus can't return until the temple is rebuilt. And so I, I have a friend who takes a lot of trips back and forth to Jerusalem, and he, he, uh, he's trying to get a movement going to fund the rebuilding of the temple so Jesus can return. But let me tell you, the temple has been rebuilt. Do you know what I'm talking about? You are the temple. You don't have to wait for the rebuilding of a temple. The temple is here. It says that all over the place in the New Testament, that you are the temple of God. So Jesus can return any time. The temple has been built. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's the chief cornerstone. Absolutely. Amen. So um, anyway, I tend to get sidetracked sometimes. Let, let me go to, okay, so the application of verse 28, I think, is very clear that we are the seed of Abraham. We are the, the promise. We are the children of promise. And verse 29 speaks of exactly what Paul and the other gospel preachers were experiencing when he says that just, uh, just as Ishmael and the descendants of Ishmael persecuted Isaac and the descendants of Isaac, he's saying it's true now. You know, the, those who are the spiritual seed of Isaac are being persecuted by those who are the spiritual seed of Ishmael. And that's, I think, what his point is in verse 29. But we are heirs of the free. We are free, and we're not heirs. They are not heirs, nor are they free. Those that are part of Jerusalem, those who are part, that are part of the legalistic um, way of thinking. Let me go on to these last two verses. Nevertheless, what sayeth the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir of the son with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So that's, that's the analogy of Sarah and Hagar in a, from a spiritual sense. Now, he used several different analogies here, but one of them is the fact that you are, if your faith is in Jesus as the seed of Abraham, then we are children of Sarah. And if you're believing in self-effort to get you to heaven, you are spiritually speaking descendants of Hagar, and you are so. And it's a, the, he contrasted it between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, and the earthly Jerusalem compared to the heavenly Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem. So, verse thirty: Just as Hagar and Ishmael would not have any part. Now, let me read these two verses again to get myself uh, on track here. Nevertheless. What saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the, with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So just as Hagar and Ishmael would, would not be part of the inheritance with Isaac, so those of the old covenant law, those who ha are, are those in covenant with law, with its legalism, will not inherit the promise of justification that comes by faith. We're not obtaining, we, we don't obtain right standing with God through law, the bondwoman, Hagar, Mount Sinai, but through faith, the free woman, Sarah, um, Mount Zion. So God didn't, God didn't just have pity on us and forgive us. <laughs> He birthed his very life in, into us, and he calls us his sons. Okay, the, the, the gospel is exciting. And the, the, main thing for us to, the main thing for us is Christianity is a transformation. It's a transformation in the heart. It's not behavior modification, but it's heart transformation. So as long as you're trying to improve yourself from the outside in, you're going to be constantly disappointed and frustrated right? Because it's just, you just can't do it. But when you're transformed on the inside, like one song that we sing from time to time about 
you know, from the inside out. It happens on the inside, and if it truly happened on the inside, it will eventually reflect outwardly. It may take some people more time than other people for it to reflect outwardly, and that probably largely depends on how much time, quality time you spend in his presence and, you know, just praying and, and, and your intimacy with God and being fully focused on grace and faith. So it all boils down to knowing who you are, knowing who you are in Christ and knowing what you have. If you don't see yourself, I, I hear people all the time cutting themselves down. Just this morning, I heard somebody say, <laughs> he, he knows who he is and you know who he is, ta talking about uh, his mind wasn't working or something like that. <laughs> and, you know, I had to correct him and say, you've got the mind of Christ. Because he's a believer. He's part of us online. <laughs> So uh, you, you have to keep in mind, our church isn't just those that are in the room. Our church, there's at least this many more that watch online. Uh, sometimes, you know, maybe not live, but some of them watch a little bit later. But don't, well, not always. Sometimes it's distance. Sometimes it's other, other, uh, other issues. But we'll take the people however we can get them. <laughs> The word is going forth, so that's what matters. Hallelujah. But, you know, don't say negative things about you. Say what God says about you. Some people are afraid to, to uh, you know, they, I don't know. People think differently than I do. I just think, some people think, well, if I say something about myself that isn't true, that I'm lying. You know, but if I'm agreeing with God, I'm not lying. You know, I may have aches and pains in my body, but if I say by his stripes I'm healed, I'm not lying. I'm just agreeing with God. If my bank account says empty and I say, you know, by he became poor so I could be rich, you know, I'm agreeing with God. I'm not contradicting the natural circumstances necessarily, but, but, but the higher truth is what God says about me. So anyway, I'm, I'm getting down to, to just saying basically that it all boils down to who you are in Christ and the full ramifications of what it means to be in Christ and to be the seed of Abraham. You know, God, again, God, God loves you. And, um, this, this is such a repeated theme of Paul's. He conveys it in a different way, but all the way through Romans, we saw this and all the way through Galatians, we see this. He's basically emphasizing this, this idea over and over and over again. And I believe I've only got two more messages to share from Galatians. I'm going to do, um, probably next week, a message on the fruit of the spirit from Galatians cha chapter five. And then, and then I'll do chapter six. The chapter six one might be, I might skip a couple weeks before I do do that one, but we'll get to it eventually. But anyway, I want to transition into communion and what I want to do the way we did this last time. I like the way we did it. We won't do it this way every time, but I kind of would like to do it the same way we did last time. Um, that next slide should be, what is that next slide? Okay, so, um, brother, could you do me a favor and pass these out for me? I appreciate it. And go, go ahead and start playing that next, that next one's a song, right? This has become one of my favorite Lord songs now. Bless. So. 